This is Bob Lewis, and I'm here at, here at Felicity, the center of the world, at the Pioneers of Sport Parachuting Pioneers Weekend with the esteemed Jacques Andre Estelle, the father of our sport. And I just want to mention the appreciation that the International Skydiving Museum and Hall of Fame and the entire sport thanks you for your gift of sport parachuting to the United States and to the world. Uh, I'd like to speak for just a moment about uh, your time after the Marines and the 1950s and how the sport went from being just a basically life-saving devices for military guys and some of them that bought them after the war for fun and how you turned it from that into the sport with, uh, with championships and cups and, and what it is today. Well, first of all, you failed to mention but I invented the force of gravity. <laughs> so no, sorry. No, <laughs> much too much praise. You know Tennyson, and they praised them to his face with their foreign uh, grace. Uh, with their, anyway, I, it's a poem. Uh, no. So you but, got out of the Marines in 52, no, I'm guessing? Or? No, the parachuting okay. started well before the Marines because I made my first parachute jump because I had bought a $600 airplane with my first earnings. And flying by day, you could hopefully glide to a field when the engine cut out, but at night you had to jump. So I bought a $10 parachute. And when I went to have it packed by Joe Crane, who is well known, as, who really should be the founder of everything, because Joe Crane founded the National Parachute Jumpers Riggers, which was, believe it or not, when I looked at the charter, a union. And he got this union as the parachute branch of the FAI, which was strictly non-profit. He got it as the branch of the National Aeronautic Association, which was, if they had read the chapter, would have flipped and kicked him out. So the first thing I did, uh, well, no, anyway, Joe Kane refused to pack the chute and told me it was a piece of junk. And I told him, well, when I fly at night, I don't know whether I'll have the guts to jump or not. Uh, where can I get, I've heard of jump outfits where you have two parachutes. Do you have one of those? Yes, I do. May I rent it from you? No. Why? Last time I rented it, the guy killed himself. Well, uh, do you know anyone who has a jump outfit? Oh, yes. So I contacted the guy, rented uh, his jump outfit, agreed to meet him at Deer Park Airport, because the only other way to make a parachute jump was to join the Army for four years. And I was working on Wall Street, so I was, you know, arrived in coat and tie and uh, no protective gear, whatever, of course. So he had me jump off a chair a few times and pointed to the ripcord and says, look, you count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you grab that and you pull. So with that considerable amount of instruction, I said, well, how will I know where to jump? Because I mean, you're going to tell me where to jump, right, when you pilot the plane. And he said, I don't fly. And there were a bunch of guys listening to all of this, laughing away, and one of them said, I'll fly the kid. I was 20 years old, so I wasn't really a kid. And the, he was a real estate salesman. And I said, well, Mr. Holden, have you ever done this before? No, but I know these things. So I don't know if you ever got into a Piper J2 with a jump outfit, 
but it's a very small plane, very hard to get into, and I didn't even think about the problems of getting out. And we went up, and I was to jump when the man who rented me for a jump outfit, a man named McAlpin, would wave a handkerchief from another Piper Cub. We never saw the second Cub. So we came over the airport at about, I guess, 1,500 feet or so, and the, he said, jump. I said, what did you say? <laughs> I was really scared to death. Jump. So it was a matter of honor and struggling out of a J2 was not the easiest thing. And so I was tumbling, I pulled, and of course I was head down, and the opening shock was tremendous. There were actually cases of people having broken necks from the opening shock. And after, there was this white canopy, the blue sky, silence. No sensation of vertigo. And after the fear, the beauty, it was almost a religious experience. I thought, I have to do this again. Then I saw I was landing on top of an airplane, and I pulled, and when I woke up, I was out maybe 30 seconds or so. No helmet, of course. <coughs> when, when I woke up, uh, I went to have a cup of coffee with my instructor. The cup was full. By the time it got to my lips, there was hardly any on the bottom. First jump. Very good. So how did that end up? How did that end up uh, getting involved with, let's say, the IPC? Uh... No. Well, what happened next was I, I asked Jack Holden the, to fly my own plane. And I made a second jump on Long Island. You know, we just flew along, saw a big field, and I jumped <laughs> and hitchhiked home. <laughs> so that went off all right. The third jump is worth noting because there, I, I, I drove out with my jump outfit to Westchester County Airport. And the manager, was a Air Force colonel who said, listen, kid, you jump anywhere near my airport and you go to jail. And there were pilots there, and one of the guys said to me, well, I'll take you up, we'll go find a field. Can you imagine that and today? And, and so I can't remember the airplane exactly, but we were seated side by side, a two-seater. I think it was a lost comb with the door on, of course. So we found a nice open area, you know, a golf course. And so I got out and I jumped and I landed on top of the tallest tree you can imagine. And before I knew it, there, there was a state policeman underneath. You won't believe this, but it was a Saxon Woods golf course and they had they had uh, absolute for, uh, a long list of things that were forbidden, including parachuting. So I went to, they immediately hauled me off to the hose gal, you know. To, so, and of course, it made the news. And I worked for a firm that invested money for widows and orphans. So I was told if, this, and if anything like that ever happens again, you're fired. Well, I, I wanted to keep jumping a bit, and so I decided to jump at, you know, further away at air shows. Well, they always were delighted to have a parachutist show up. And, you know, what was interesting in those days is there was always some guy with an airplane who'd take you up. <laughs> It, it was another world. I mean, talking about laws and liabilities and, and 
for CAA or F Fury Show, FAA. None of that existed. So, I, in order not to get in trouble, I adopted the name Jacques Bartini, the toast of the Riviera. And I had two girls passing the hat. Well, after about three more jumps, oh, I, I gave up parachuting because I was getting too beat up. Not just the opening shock, but never know, knowing where you'd land, really, and banging into buildings and whatnot. And uh, so, but I did. Uh, no, that was later. So th those years were 1950. I gave up parachuting in 1951 and forgot about it. And then came the war and then the period you're mentioning. Okay. And by that time I'd forged a friendship with Joe Crane, a guy I love dearly. And I heard about a championship in Europe. So don't tell me about my being father of the sport, maybe in America, but the sport was evolving in Europe. But it was totally different. It was controlled by governments. And the clubs were government clubs, you see, and, and so on and so forth. But it was, in effect, the, be the beginning of a sport with a championship. And I read about that. And I read about the organization. And so I said to Joe, look, since by then I was vice president of the National Parachute Jumpers Riggers, which had at least 11 members, and I said, Joe, you're hooked up with the National Aeronautic Association and this and the FAI and whatnot. Send me over there as official U.S. representative. And I was over there and I, I knew that free fall was forbidden by the Army. But I knew also that the Air Force doctrine stated it was impossible to stabilize in free fall. And I saw guys stable. I mean, I, I didn't see it, it was November, but I saw in films that they were stable. And so I got the French to open up a parachuting center at uh, chalon sur saone And the famous Sam Chazac, who was one of their champions, uh, took me up and taught me free fall, freezing weather, everything screwed up. But as you know, it's very easy to learn free fall. All you have to do is do it, and then you move your arm, and you discover that you can turn and whatnot. So I came back, and at that point, I was the only guy who knew about this stuff. And the following year, I went back to the commission, or, or maybe I had already that year. No, it was 55, that year at the commission. They were discussing the 1956 World Parachuting Championship in Moscow. And I spoke up and I said, there will be a U.S. team at the championship. <laughs> you realize, of course, the situation. <laughs> <laughs> so Two I or came, three jumpers only, huh? Well, no. Well, I came back feeling like an absolute asshole because... So, I, I put out the word that we were training a U.S. team, you see, in free fall uh, for the World Championships. And they would have to come at their own expense, at train at their own expense, and we try and raise money to take the team to... Moscow, and Lou got us 500 bucks from the Carpenters Union. And we, we managed to raise about, 
about 6,000 bucks, which took us to Moscow and back and took care of all the expenses. And we wrote a beautiful thank you to everybody and published it. But anyway, so we trained in New Jersey because by that time, a lot of airports wouldn't have anything to do with parachutists. And then by that time, that was the time when I saw the charter and I said, Joe, for Christ's sakes, we're going to get kicked out of the NAA. So I said, we're going to call this thing the Parachute Club of America. He said, fine. And I wrote quickly a sport charter, you see. <laughs> and at that time, I think we had 14 members, some of which didn't pay their $5 dues. And you won't believe this, but I wrote General Gavin. 82nd, headed the 82nd Jumping Airborne Jim in Gavin. Normandy and asked him if he would come on the board of the parachute club. And he did. And there we were with this completely uh, tiny little outfit and General Gavin aboard. As, and immediately the parachute club of America was respectable. Shortly after he was named ambassador to France. So, so, you know, that's how things happen. So then we trained and went to Moscow. And by the time we, after a, a little bit of training, all the guys could stabilize and t t in free fall and do a term, which is what you had to do in the championship. And we came in six out of 10 teams. And there I saw the sleeve and right away I thought, that's the answer to the opening shop, which it was. But at the, at the time, I was the only guy who would jump one, because the rest of the guys on the team said, listen, this darn thing might stay locked. <laughs> and that was, of course, the big concern. And then, and then if the sleeves would fly off all over, you have to go pick them up. And so we patented the attached sleeve. And I don't remember, I think it's a joint patent of Lou and I. I thought we need to attach this, but I can't remember if it was Lou or I who did it. But anyway, Lou was very involved at that point. So when I started Parachutes Incorporated, Lou was the first guy I hired. And I realized two things at that, that time, you see. I was head of the Parachute Club of America and I was starting a private company. And so, to me, having been trained on Wall Street, that was a no-no. You can't mix a non-profit and a profit. So, shortly after, I passed the PCA to a guy named Russ Gunby who took it to California. But before that, I thought what we, have, what the guys need is a challenge. So I created the D license, which then was, you know, seemed impossible to obtain, you see. And when I created the instructor's license, so I took I-1 and on the Ds, Lou said, well, you should take D-1. I said, no, you made a jump before I did. Also, you're better parachuters because one of the trophies I have mm -hmm. is from a competition where I came in first. And that's one of the very rare times I beat Lou, who, who was a better parachutist than I was. And, and uh, so I, I gave him D1 and I took D2. And the big thing, was the fact that mm -hmm. no landowners would allow parachutists because they were afraid of damage, lawsuits, this, dam above all, you know, some guy said, well, if you're not coming on my farm, I don't want you landing through the window, damaging my roof, you know, that was the attitude. And so I got for the Parachute Club of America an insurance that went and ten thousand dollars of insurance in case you broke people's windows or damaged their roofs or any damage. 
and then everybody let them jump. And that and the membership soared. And and at that point uh, we'd also created Parachutist magazine, which I gave. We'd also created I created the, the Collegiate League and whatnot. And so the foundations of the sport were laid. Then we decided, you know, we started Parachutes Incorporated. And the problem was, the, the problems with the sport were the opening shock solved by the sleeve, the landing shock, which was caused by a very high porosity chute coming down fast, the high porosity being necessary to lower the opening shock which was no longer there. So now we could put in high porosity, drive the, uh, through a hole at the back, put a couple of toggles and have a steerable chute because the landing was a vector of three forces. The wind with the old circular, you never knew where you'd land. The vertical, which was too fast because of the high porosity, and the oscillation. So there you had a landing shock which was such that even well-trained paratroopers would get hurt. And that was why the army uh, felt that anything to do with civilians was crazy. They had another reason. One of the great free-fall parachutists, there were very few of them at the time, was a, a, an Italian named Canarotto. And he preached, he was macho, he preached, you do not open your parachute until you can smell the grass. He planted himself, but so did all his disciples. <laughs> that did nothing to increase confidence in sport parachuting. <laughs> also, the uh, the jump limit set by the government was a thousand feet. Well, you didn't really want to start free fall from a thousand feet. Now, that, so the big problem was the problem of accuracy and landing. That was a third. Opening shock, landing shock, accuracy and landing. And we determined the amount of time a parachute would spend in the air, the average parachute is average weight from an opening height of 2,000 feet, which seemed ridiculous in those days because the chutes would go anywhere. And with a long piece of crepe paper and a weight, we created a wind drift indicator that you drop right over the target. There were different winds at different levels, but it didn't matter. If it landed 400 yards east, you jump four southeast, you jump 400 yards northwest, where it drifted over the target. And got, because the, the first competition I competed in was the 1951 Detroit Air Races. And the target was a line across the entire airport. And I was one of the two or three guys who even hit the airport. The others didn't make it. <laughs> so all of a sudden, we had solved the problem. Now, Lou had a great deal to do with the wind drift indicator. I can't remember exactly. I was compute. You see, I, I did the computation on how far you fell in free fall, when you should open your chute and all that. And we created the first logbook with instructions there were basic safety regulations which took half a page and the amount of distance fallen in free fall you see so many etc and then we put uh, an altimeter and a stopwatch on top of the river and then we decided to put radios on students and since a first jump is truly scary, 
I removed everything from instruction except what was really needed and made a 45 minute course. And the army claimed that my ideas would kill so many people, but we went 11 years without a fatality. And that was the start of a sport. Thank you. Thank you, John.